Mm, hello, hello, good morning, lovely ones. My name is Liz. I'll give you just a couple minutes. There'll be some more people popping on. So we will have about 40 women joining together this morning, which is so amazing. And I am so, so grateful that you are here. Maybe just drop um, your, your name or where you're from in the comments. Hello, hello. Britannia Beach, Oops. amazing. Squamish, Lindsay, welcome. Mm. Just give it another minute or so. And thank you for carving out this time. I know it is not easy to do, especially in December. Um, the month gets away from us so quickly. Did anyone else's children start advent calendars this morning and wake up at like 6 a.m. ready to party? <laughs> awesome. Mama of two boys from Squamish, welcome. Thank you for popping on. Now, I I do have a full slide deck today, <clears throat> but it is set up so that if you just need to pop on some headphones and continue with your day, you should be able to get still a lot out of it just from the audio. So that's always an option. And of course, if you have to pop off early, um, I will send the recording to everyone. So you will be able to come back to it. I know it's not always so straightforward to carve out time to do something like this. So let's get started. Um, so this is Inner Mastery for the Modern Mother. And what we're going to look at specifically is how to use yoga to really reclaim your energy, to fortify your body, to improve your key relationships, to support your mental health, and to cultivate some clarity in your life. So in today's training, we are going to look specifically at why modern mothers are feeling stuck, exhausted, frustrated, distracted, foggy, brain fog, anyone, right? And just uninspired. We're going to look at what it is costing us to live like this and what we can do to shift from survival, so living in that state of survival, into a state of renewal and how shifting our biochemistry, so working into our nervous system, shifting our biochemistry can help us to create that increased energy, help us feel alive, enhance again those relationships, um, provide clarity and inspiration on your path and purpose, and to just bring a bit of mental ease and peace into your life. So a little bit about me, just so you know, um, a little bit of relatability, because I don't know about you guys, but I have gone to like counselors, marriage counselors who've never been married or had kids. And I'm like, uh, the theories aren't landing for me, right? Um, so I want to let you know that if you are feeling rage, frustration, anxiety, um, if your marriage is failing, all these things, I have totally been there. Um, so I'll just kind of breeze through a little bit of my history and then we'll get right into the content and how uh, we can support you. And I will just share what has worked so well for me and what the science says. So my mission is really to fuse the healing arts with scientific understanding. So I'm actually trained, trained as a registered nurse um, and eventually I left nursing and pursued the healing arts more in depth. So I'm also a Reiki master and a yoga teacher. 
Uh, I had three children in two years, which is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> and it was truly my yoga practice that really saved me in so many ways. So from physical healing, after I had the twins, I had a massive separation, a diastasis in my belly. So the six pack muscles like stretched apart. I could fit a whole hand in there and was told I would need surgery, but I just went to my practice and I never ended up with the surgery. Um, it also helped me uh, with emotions and mentally. So I definitely had some postpartum rage, postpartum anxiety for sure. And my marriage honestly was over. At one point it was so over. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but it was really this daily practice that helped me to kind of bring it back to life. Um, and I've also worked now for about six years supporting local women pre and postnatally. So my story kind of begins uh, in the end of my university years. So I really crashed and burned at the end of my five years in university. Um, so I came from this community that was really right wing, very you know, medical profession oriented, scientifically backed, healing arts was not at all part of my upbringing. And I put myself through school primarily on academic and athletic scholarships. So in five years, I earned two degrees, one in nursing, one in kinesiology. And I also was a leader on the university hockey team which sounds really cool, but it actually was not. I was not sleeping more than four hours a night. Um, I developed a pneumonia that was resistant to antibiotics. So I was just taking round after round and getting sicker to the point that I was like coughing up blood. Um, I also didn't get my period for about two years. And when I talked to the doctor about that, he just suggested I go on the pill so that I would get my period every month and know that I wasn't pregnant. So I stopped seeing that doctor, as you can imagine. Um, and I also, my body was destroyed. I had partially torn ligaments in my knee, a separated shoulder, just falling apart. And Western medicine, which I was such a believer in, um, it was not able to support me at all. Everything was just getting worse. And so I very, very reluctantly had to turn towards some alternative healing modalities. I started seeing a naturopath and I started seeing a Reiki master and I found yoga and meditation. <clears throat> and so this turned everything around for me. And so once I started pursuing this, my life changed dramatically and I call it this love and light lifestyle. So I went from this like crazy burnout lifestyle to this lifestyle where I was practicing yoga for like at least 90 minutes every single day. And I was like creating these extravagant plant-based meals. Like I probably spent a few hours just cooking for myself every day and shopping at the organic food store. And, um, you know, it was lovely, but I was very naive. Um, it was about this time that I started to leave nursing. I met my husband and I followed him to Australia and decided to pursue the healing arts full time. So all of a sudden my work and my lifestyle was all healing arts and I felt amazing. Um, in 2011, we welcomed our first child and it was a shock to the system for sure. He was an amazing baby, not colicky, nothing like that. We had some feeding issues, but overall he was like a really easy baby and we struggled. Um, so, you know, this birth into motherhood really thrust me into a life of paradox. I was so grateful, but also I was really suffering. And while I was happy with the life that I created, I also like really grieved the life that I lost and just losing that autonomy over my time and the autonomy over my body. Um, it was really, really challenging for me, but we still had a two to one ratio of adults to babies and we got through it. It was a little rocky, but we kind of pulled through and then we decided, hey, let's try for our next babe. We were planning two kids and straight away we conceived 
twins, which was not in the plan. We were so surprised. My son was 15 months old and we had these identical twin girls. And when I told my husband after the ultrasound uh, that it was twins, he just got this like deer in the headlights look and fear on his face. And he stayed there for about three years. <laughs> it was intense. And so this was major crash and burn. Number two, sleeplessness was taken to the next level. I think I was about three months postpartum the first time I got four hours of broken sleep. So it wasn't even in a row. Like it was just full on. It was baby one, baby two, son, baby one, baby two, son waking up. Like I wouldn't even go to sleep between tending to all of these tiny humans and resentment and rage towards my husband was like crazy. You guys, I had never felt rage in my life before. And I was on fire. I was so mad at him all the time. Um, I was so overwhelmed with my responsibility, but also underwhelmed with what my life had turned into. I was just this domestic task manager, always busy, but getting nothing done. It was never like finished. There was no end point. And rock bottom really hit um, when my husband and I were so exhausted and irritable. We actually went from this place of being really like fiery and fighting with each other to a point of like hopeless and sad and just being like, this is done. Like this is over. There's nothing we can do to save this. And it was even at a point where we told my mother-in-law, like we're separating. It's hopeless. We can't get out of this. And I just happened to be meeting a yoga teacher friend uh, for coffee the one day. And one little thing that she said sparked my curiosity. And she said, what if your relationship is just in a winter? What if right now you're supposed to be in this place of things falling apart, decomposing, letting go of what's not serving you, maybe darkness and this coldness is part of the process. And it was just enough to pique my curiosity to say, what if there is a spring, right? What if we got through this? What could that look like? So hanging on by the thinnest of threads, we decided to move forward and just give it one more chance, try to save the marriage. So we started going to counseling and it wasn't the first time we went to counseling, but we were both so into it this time, but still I just found it aggravated things. It was like I had these fresh wounds and we just kept pulling the back open and I would just unleash on him over and over and I couldn't stop. And I told the counselor, you know what? I think I just have to find a place inside myself where I'm okay, no matter what he does where I'm unshakable, regardless of his choices. Um, I need to take full responsibility for my own happiness. And she told me that that was very unrealistic and reminded me that I had options, meaning maybe it would be better if I left. And so I didn't go back to him because I knew, I knew that there was power in yoga and meditation. And that if I could change, then our situation, our circumstance could change. So I had to get back into my yoga, but my kids were tiny and so dependent and I still wasn't sleeping through the night. So I really had to look at my yoga practice. 90 minutes, totally out of the question. Going to a studio at that point still was pretty much out of the question, at least if I wanted to go on any sort of consistent basis. And so I had to really pour over this yoga practice and look at like, what will work and why does it work? And what could I do in the smallest amount of time to get the most impact in my life? And so while my practice looked nothing like it did before I had kids, it still was able to bring me back to my center and bring me back to that love and light place while still being immersed in the world. So initially when I found healing arts, I was in this other dimension where I could just be so self-centered and devote my whole day to my well-being. 
Now I have to devote my whole day to my kids' well being, to trying to put my marriage back together and fit in this work wherever I could. And so some days it was literally five or 10 minutes. Other days, maybe I could squeeze in 20 minutes to an hour. It had to be versatile and it had to be effective. So I jumped into it and again, like it just brought me back from the brink. So that was about six years ago. I practice every single day. Sometimes, like I said, maybe just 10 minutes, but it's enough to just bring me back to center. So any day that you have stress, you need something to move that stress out of your body and come back into a state of responsibility um, for your own happiness. So I continue to do this every day. I became less reactive in my marriage. So what normally would have set me off, I was able to just sit with and not be so triggered by the things that used to trigger me. I started being way more present with my kids. I was way happier and inspired. And instead of just surviving, I was starting to actually create new things. So when my girls were about two, the twins, um, I started putting together like a yoga festival for the community and um, my body started coming back together. So that diastasis, that abdominal separation started coming back together on its own. And like I said, at the start, I ended up avoiding massive surgery. That's like a $10,000 personal expense because of just showing up to yoga. That is all that I was doing to heal it. Um, I was able to develop clarity around my needs and desires and to ask assertively for what I needed and also to be flexible in how I was going to receive the help that I needed. So it changed everything for me. And I just want to be clear, not at all a quick fix, kind of the opposite. This was the cumulative effect of showing up intentionally day after day and just doing these simple practices that I knew worked. And I continue to do these practices every day. The process wasn't linear. It still isn't linear. Some days are better than others, but every day I am able to come back to center. So the practice works as long as you keep showing up for it, especially when you show up for it when it's inconvenient or when you just feel like you don't want to. <clears throat> so I would love for you to really imagine what if you had clarity around your needs and desires and you treated them as if they were as important as the needs and desires of your children, of your partner, of your colleagues at work? What if you could feel strong and healthy and confident and sexy and energized and assertive? What if you felt more patient and present and compassionate in your relationships? What if you enjoyed improved mental health and resilience and could lift yourself out of anxiety and depression? What if you felt worthy of showing up for? How would your life change? How would your parenting change? Would you do what it takes to get to this place if you knew that it was possible? Now, this might be the part where I read your mind a little bit and you're like, yeah, this sounds great. I'm so glad it worked out for you, Liz, but I don't have the time or I don't have the money to invest in myself or I don't have the energy or maybe you just don't think it'll work for you. Maybe you've tried yoga in the past and it's not really helped. Or maybe you're saying the studios are all closed right now due to COVID um, and online yoga doesn't really work for me. Or maybe you're saying, I don't see how stretching can help me change my life. Um, and I wanna show you that it is possible to create transformation without taking a lot of time. If you know what you need to do, you can come back to center in five minutes, in 10 minutes, if you practice regularly. And as far as not having the energy, the, you build the energy. 
right? When you're living in chronic stress and not getting out of that state, it's actually going to drain your energy. So you need to do something to, to restore your energy. And then these ideas of like, it won't work for me. I've tried yoga before. It didn't work. Or I don't do online yoga. can't get into a studio. I would just really encourage people to, to try something new. So often we want change in our lives, but we don't want to change ourselves. So whenever you start to hear yourself saying, yeah, but I don't do this or I don't like that, maybe really question those things and, and branch out, try the things that you think you don't like. And then this, I don't see how stretching can change anything in my life. If that's in your head, then I apologize on behalf of the entire yoga community because yoga is a spiritual practice more than anything else. That's what it's for. And it's really just in the West that it's gotten this, um, you know, that we perceive it as just a stretching practice. I don't care if you can touch your toes. I want to know what's going on in your heart. What's going on in your mind? Are you able to increase your stress tolerance through your practice so that things don't get to you as much? I want you to master your inner world. I actually don't care what your pose looks like. It's just a playground for us to move through things that challenge us and practice responding. Okay. So who is this training for? This is for those mothers who want to transform chaos into peace, who want to transform exhaustion into vitality and that brain fog into clarity. This is for mothers who know that they need more nourishment, but they maybe don't know where to start or how to get it in a lifestyle that is so full on already. This is for mothers who want to create shift in their lives, but they can't just take two hours for themselves or pop out to a class. This is for the mothers who want to remember their inner spark and bring it back to the forefront of their lives. Sometimes when we go into motherhood, it's like we've lost who we were before. And while you are irreversibly changed in motherhood, those essential pieces, we need to learn to bring them back into our lives. So we have to look at how can we support ourselves to bring back those essential pieces that make us who we really are. Um, so if you feel like you're lost, you've lost yourself, this training is for you. Um, this is for mothers who want to be more present and patient with their children. And mothers who want more ease and joy and celebration in their lives. This is not for anyone who wants a quick fix. It is not going to happen. Um, and if anyone promises you a quick fix, I would suggest that you run because it really doesn't exist. Um, if you're not ready to take action, I can't help you. I can give you information but really it will come down to you and what you're willing to invest, um, how much time and energy and focus you can invest in yourself. This is not for people who are totally committed to this myth of martyrdom, that to be a good woman or a good mother means that you have to just completely lose yourself in the service of everyone else. Yes, of course you have to show up and serve as a mother, but there is also space for you to be a human right um and it's not for people who are really committed to blaming their feelings or their how they're feeling on someone else and there was a point you know like when my husband and i were really in a hard place when my girls were probably in the first three months where i really wanted to be right he was wrong he was doing the bad stuff and i wouldn't have been ready for this at that time so if you're there, all good. I have been there. I get it. I see it. I just won't be able to help you until you kind of get past that part and say, I'm just going to do whatever it takes um, to transform this. So here is a quote from Glennon Doyle, her book Untamed. Amazing. I highly encourage you to check it out. So she says, I burned the memo that defines selflessness as the pinnacle of womanhood. But first, I forgave myself for believing that lie for so long. Selfless women make for an efficient society, but not a beautiful, true, or just one. When women lose themselves, the world loses its way. We do not need more selfless women. Right? It's 
the same thing with the oxygen mask on the plane. You got to fill your own cup, ladies, so that you have something to pour from. So we're going to jump right into the content here. Part one, we're going to look like physiologically, why are we feeling stuck and exhausted and frustrated and distracted and foggy and uninspired from the lens of the nervous system? What is going on in our bodies? Then we're going to look at what does it cost us to live in this state of chronic stress? Then we're going to look at how yoga practices can specifically help us to shift our biology from survival to a state of creation and connection. And then we're going to look at what becomes possible when we master our inner world and live primarily from that biology of creation and connection. So are you ready? Are you ready to step into possibility? Are you ready to try something new and to let go of the excuses that have held you back, even if they're valid, right? Even if your excuses are valid, are you ready to be like, you know what, enough, enough of that. Are you ready to prioritize yourself so you can show up fully in your life, not just as a mom, also as a human in your own right? And are you ready to change your energy, body, relationships, and mental health? For the better. Part one. So let's look at why we are feeling this way. So we have really a balancing act going on that is unprecedented. So when my mom was a girl, she said that her mom would just give her a sandwich in the morning and send her out the door. And she would go out after breakfast and come back at dinner time. And her mom had no idea where she was all day. Now that kind of free reign parenting is actually kind of illegal now. Like if you did that, there's a good chance you would be reported. Um, you know, there's even people that get reported because their kids are naked in their own backyard. So we're living in this like kind of ridiculous time where our kids don't have even a fraction of that kind of freedom, which means that they're under our feet. Um, to pretty much 24 seven. Um, we also are living at a time where we have access to so much information and we want the best for our kids. So in the past, it was enough like just to keep them alive. If your kids are alive, gold star, like you're rocking it. And now we're really looking at like, are they getting all their macronutrients? Are they getting all their micronutrients? Are they hydrated enough? How's their reading? How's their writing? How's their math? Um, how are they socially engaging? What are their friendships like? All these things, which is a beautiful thing to be able to support our children this way, but it's also very heavy for us to take that full responsibility. We also lack the village and the multi-generational living that people had in the past. So if we want support, we have to seek it out and we have to pay for it. And we have to orchestrate all these schedules to make sure it happens. Whereas we really evolved to be social beings and for a whole village to kind of raise kids together. Now it's falling primarily on mothers. And there are a lot of amazing fathers out there too, of course. Um, but even research suggests most of it does fall on mothers. And at the same time, we're doing all these things and we are being bombarded with messages that we're not being enough, we're not doing enough, we're not volunteering enough. All these things by this like Pinterest culture where we measure our everyday experiences by someone else's highlight reel. And so it just really undermines us. On top of that, right now we're in a pandemic and so we have, you know, less freedom and less support and more diverse responsibilities than parents in the past had. But we also are dealing with this total chaos and uncertainty um, that COVID-19 has brought into our lives. I pulled this quote from an article in The Reporter and it says, the impact on women goes far beyond the illness itself. The pandemic has ushered in the first so-called she session, 
With women initially experiencing more job losses than men and being slower to return to work, it has also resulted in women shouldering a disproportionate amount of unpaid caregiving responsibilities with children out of school and daycare. Meanwhile, women, especially women of color, are more likely to be in jobs that put them at risk of COVID-19. And there have been reports of a surge in domestic violence calls. This pandemic has hit women hard, physically, financially, and emotionally. And I would just bud off of that and say, it's not just women, mothers have been absolutely hammered. And at first I was like, why are people not talking about how hard this is hitting mothers? And then I realized because mothers are so freaking busy handling everything that we don't even have time to stop and be like, hey, look what's going on here. <laughs> We're really suffering. So even though this quote is more specific to um, women, mothers are like next level. It's the mothers that are taking care of the kids and managing the big households. It's absolutely wild what we are going through right now. <clears throat> so we're living in this chronic stress because we have so many balls in the air all the time. And the nervous system that we're living with is one that we inherited from our ancestors. So it evolved to keep them safe during acute stresses that they faced in their harsh, short lives in the wilderness. And it is not designed to deal with chronic stress like what we've got going on today. Um, it was meant to switch on, get us away from a threat, and then switch off and come back to renewal. So it equips us to do things like run and fight or play dead. But these are not appropriate responses for dealing with things like in-laws and taxes or kids melting down in the grocery store or long-term pandemics where the ground just keeps on moving. So I want to take you through something. This is called the polyvagal theory. And you don't have to memorize this chart, but basically we've got these three different levels of engagement that we are living in. Um, so we can either be in this state, in the green section where you see this kind of social engagement. This is like our safety state. I'm gonna go through each one of these on their own, um, but I just wanna show you, so where we start to get a little bit more activation of the nervous system, a little bit more um, stress response happening, we start to move into this fight or flight state. And if that stress is sustained or if the stress is so life-threatening that we just need to um, go into self-preservation mode, trying to survive, then we get pushed up into the red zone, um, which is where something seems so life-threatening that our best option is to basically play dead. So I'm gonna break down what each of these are and then what is going on for women, for mothers um, in our nervous systems on a daily basis. So this is the green zone and this is called the ventral vagal branch of the nervous system. So it's one branch of the parasympathetic nervous system. And when we are operating in this state, then we are in a state of renewal and creation and curiosity and connection. So we're really in a place of safety on a cellular level. And when we're in that place of safety, we can be really present, we can be creative, we can get a lot of really deep nourishing rest and we feel engaged, we feel compassionate, we feel understanding and connected to other humans. So our oxytocin, this bonding chemical starts to increase, our ability to relate and connect increases and our defensive responses decrease. So ideally we're spending about 80% of our time in ventral vagal dominance. And we just have these transient blends of going into that yellow zone or maybe even that red zone just to get us through our day to help us survive. And then we wanna come back into this green zone, this ventral vagal state. So the yellow state, this is our sympathetic 
nervous system. So this becomes activated once you start to get, um, you know, more arousal, more stress, a little more activation. There's maybe a threat or something exciting happening. And we move into this fight or flight response. And so this part of our nervous system was really designed to mobilize all of our energy quickly so that we can mount a quick and powerful response to an immediate threat. So it's so effective and helpful if we needed to do something like jump out of the way of a moving bus or if a cougar were to cross our path while we're hiking, we need this energy, we need this fire, this fight, it gets us going. We actually move into the state a little bit just in the morning to get us out of bed and get us going. So it's really helpful. It's something we need in our lives. Um, but when we get stuck in this fight or flight state for long periods of time, then we start to really deplete our resources. We break down physically and mentally. And as adrenaline and cortisol flood the body, our heart rates go up, our blood pressure increases, our breathing starts to get more shallow and quicker and our brain changes. So we become on really high alert. We're searching for threats in the environment and we're operating from more primitive parts of our brain. And this is a survival mechanism because you don't have time to sit and think on a cellular level your body thinks that there is a massive threat and it has to be ready to mobilize energy and so you need to be very reflexive you need to just see this the threat and respond without thinking about things and mauling it over so you're just being driven by these sort of animalistic behaviors not from your higher level thinking the higher level thinking is offline because you want to survive and so what this means is that we are going to be reacting through unconscious programming so it's just going to happen we're not even thinking about how we're responding we are just going to react and in the long term it inhib inhibits our immune response our digestion and our ability to relate to other people so those like defense mechanisms are really turned up and that oxytocin, that bonding chemical just plummets, comes down. So again, ideally this is a survival instinct that is short lived. So it liberates us from threats and then we return into that green zone, that ventral vagal state of renewal and connection. And then there is the red zone, dorsal vagal tone. This is actually a separate branch of the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, so when we are in that sustained fight or flight for a long time and our body finally hits a point where it's like, I can't do this anymore. It starts to decompensate that could push you into this um, red zone or it could also be just something happens and it's so life-threatening that your body just shuts down. So what is happening on a cellular level is your brain, your body are responding to this threat that could be real or it could even be just something that we have thought about that might or might not be real. And it's saying, okay, our whole survivalhood is at stake here. We need to freeze. We need to shut down, we need to give up, we need to play dead. So that yellow zone, there's kind of this mentality of like, yes, I can. And then once you get pushed to that red zone, you're like, no, I can't. You start to feel hopeless and trapped, ashamed, numb, helpless. And so you're gonna see some of the opposite things happening. Your heart rate is gonna drop. Your blood pressure is gonna drop. You're gonna lose muscle, muscle tone and expression in the face. The breath is gonna be really shallow and your sex drive is gonna plummet. Immune response is inhibited. So everything starts to shut down and you actually get this flood of endorphins, but not like the good kind, like the runner's high kind. This flood of endorphins isn't to make you feel good. It's to make you feel numb. It's so that you don't have to feel. And so this again, great thing. If you're being attacked by a grizzly bear, you want to play dead. This will help you. Um, but if you get stuck in this mode, it is so hard. It feels so dark, 
so depressing and even hopeless. Now, the good news is that even though when you're in this state, it feels hopeless, it's not. You can do things to shift your state. So let's look at, okay, so that's the overarching theory, but how is this actually manifesting in modern mothers? So first you will feel exhausted. Um, your energy reserves are constantly mobilized to deal with the threats. You're constantly mobilized in an effort to run or fight. And so you're not storing any energy. You're just constantly burning it. And your body is just like primed for action all the time. It also becomes difficult to get a restful sleep because your brain and body are still searching for threats, even when it's time to rest. Um, you're going to feel distracted and foggy because again, those higher centers of your brain are going to go offline. You're going to be operating from this really uh, reptilian brain and where you just are looking at like immediate survival. How am I going to get through this? What's in front of me right now? And so you're not going to be able to hold a vision. You're not going to be able to effectively plan or remember or prioritize because that is not going to keep you alive in this moment. Um, for the same reason, you're going to start to feel uninspired and kind of stuck in a rut. So we're going to be leaning on our basic survival instincts when we're stuck in a stressful state. And what that means is that on a cellular level, we already think that our livelihood is really compromised, that we're in danger. And it is not a time to seek out adventure. It is not a time to take risks. You will be prone to choose what is familiar, what is predictable, because even if you don't really like what's familiar and predictable, at least it's going to feel safe. It's going to feel familiar. Um, you're going to start to feel frustrated and resentful, even rage. So as you get um, the surge of adrenaline pumping through your body, you're going to be feeling irritable and on edge. The defense mechanisms are heightened and your brain is scanning, again, the immediate environment, looking for threats. And you know what it often lands on? is the people that are around you, especially our partners, they become the threat. What they're doing is the problem. So it might be partner, babysitter, in-law. We really think and believe that, oh, if they just did this thing different or you know, started doing that instead, I would feel better. We see them as the threat, they're the problem. And that's just how our physiology is wired. And what makes it worse is that we're not actually in a state to be able to effectively communicate with them, understand their point of view or connect with them at all. So it starts to undermine our relationships in that way. We're also going to feel anxious, depressed and hopeless. So initially under the buzz of this fight or flight system, you're going to feel this surge in energy, but there's nowhere for it to go. Right. It was created so that we could like sprint and we could fight. But what happens in our modern lives is we get this stress, we get this surge of energy, but maybe you're just sitting nursing a baby for like an hour and you can't run and you can't fight. So it just sits and simmers and bubbles inside of you and there's no outlet for it. Um, and that will make you feel anxious. You will have all this charge and nowhere for it to go. And over a sustained period, just as we saw before, we, our body will eventually decompensate and push from that yellow zone where we're going to feel really anxious into that red zone where we're going to start to feel hopeless and depressed and flat, where we have been going so hard for so long, our body is finally like, that's enough, and it starts to shut down. And then we're going to start to feel unwell. So your immune system gets put on the back burner. Again, we're under a state of stress. We need to look at what's happening right now and what's important to our survival right now. And that is not going to be things like clearing out precancerous cells. It's like, oh, that can wait. Your immune system gets turned down. Your body starts to break down. 
and you start to become more susceptible to disease and infection. Um, so you start to see, you know, maybe your kid's going to daycare and bringing home a cold and you catch every single thing that these little kids that ha are just developing a nervous, um, an immune system, you're catching everything that they bring home. Um, you also might find that you're prone to like recurring yeast infections and things like that. So you're gonna feel it in your body that way as well. So this is really important to note. To be well is not to live in a state of perpetual safety and calm, but to move fluidly from a state of adversity, risk, adventure, or excitement back to safety and calm and out again. Stress is not bad for you. Being stuck is bad for you. So we're not looking at creating a life that has no stress. That is not going to happen. What we want to be able to do is feel that stress, process it, and then be able to come back to our center. <clears throat> so this leads us to part two. I'm just going to grab a drink. So what is it costing us to be stuck in a state of chronic stress? Why, you know, we know it's bad, but what does it really cost us? So right away, it's gonna cost us joy, our peace, our fulfillment. It's gonna start costing us our sleep. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when my babies were small, I would like work so hard to get them to sleep and then finally they'd be asleep and I'd be like wide awake and stressed. Um, so it starts to compromise our sleep, our mental health. So again, we slip into depression, anxiety, our physical health, those recurring infections or just prone to pick up every bug that's passing through the community. It compromises our relationships because we're feeling so defensive all the time and it costs us our presence. And this is the craziest thing is like, for most of us, we chose this life and we created it and we wanted it. And then we're so stressed that we're actually missing the things that we so badly want to experience. And then also it is costing us our freedom to show up how we want to show up. We want to be patient. We want to be loving. We want to be kind. But when we're operating from that animalistic brain that reflexive like just respond or react instead of responding it's costing us our freedom to choose how to show up so when you're in these states of chronic stress like thinking clearly being present connecting to others and feeling well physically and mentally become nearly impossible because your cells are primed to function in ways that are not coherent with these tasks. So even though you might want it in your mind, you're like, I want to be present. I want to fix this marriage. I want to like cozy up and read a book to my kids. But actually what my body wants to do is like freak out and melt down or just like hide under a blanket and watch Netflix and eat cookies or whatever. Right. Um, but also this chronic stress is going to affect your whole family. So your inner world, it is going to be absorbed by your children and by the people that you share space with. And there's a whole field of science that's starting to emerge um, that it explores just how our brains and nervous systems synchronize to one another. And small kids are not actually able to regulate their own nervous system. So they just tie into the nervous system of their primary caregivers. So if you are feeling centered, they will feel centered. If you're not, they're not. So this begins right at birth, though I would predict, I haven't seen it in the science yet, but I predict it starts even sooner. Um, and it shapes the way the child's brain and nervous system becomes wired. So the way that we are able to regulate ourselves will be reflected in the states that our children are living in as well. So we walk around co-regulating one another all the time, synchronizing without trying, without even necessarily being aware that it's happening. 
Your internal state is profoundly contagious and it is profoundly susceptible to catching the internal states of the people around you. This mutual co-regulation begins from the earliest moments of our lives and it shapes our brains. So you might already be going, oh my gosh, like I'm a mess. Is my kid gonna be a mess? Um, what can I do about this? Know that it's not you. You're not consciously choosing to be in these reactive states. This is your stress response and you have power to change it. And that's what we're gonna get into next. But I want you to know you're not crazy. You're not ungrateful for feeling exhausted, for feeling resentful, um, for feeling so frustrated in this life that you worked so hard to create. You're just living in a state of stress that physiologically wires you to think and act in certain ways. And when we get stuck here, it can cost us everything, but we don't have to get stuck there. We're gonna pop into part three. So how can we shift from survival to creation? How can yoga support us in restoring ventral vagal tone? So again, in bringing us into that green zone, I love this quote, you can't calm the storm, so stop trying. What you can do is calm yourself, the storm will pass. How much time do we spend just trying so hard to control the external world and it doesn't work? What we need to do is work on the inner world so that we can respond creatively and appropriately to the outer world. So just like we said before, we want to be able to get out of the state of chronic stress. And there are a few ways we can hack into our nervous system and consciously move out of that physiology of fight or flight or freeze and come back into a state of creation and connection where we can rest, digest, and um, just really drop into relationship again. So we're gonna look at a couple key concepts. One is accessing the vagus nerve and the other is completing the stress cycle. So the vagus nerve, um, also known as cranial nerve 10, it connects the brain to every major organ in the body. And there are pathways that carry messages from the brain to the body. So maybe the eyes perceive a threat and then the brain is gonna send a message like prime the muscles, slow the digestion, kick off the immune system, we gotta prepare for this. But also there are pathways that move from the body back up to the brain that carry information from the body to the brain. So what we can do is start to tap into the inner workings of our nervous system by changing the patterns of information that are being sent from the body to the brain. So just how the brain can see a stressor and send out the alert to fight or run or freeze, we can take control of things like our breath, our movement, our focus, and our language to send messages to the brain that say, actually, we're safe. Actually, it's okay to rest here. So completing the stress cycle. So in addition to stimulating the vagus nerve really consciously, we need to complete the stress cycle. So what happens is there's this stressor in our life and instead of being able to respond the way our body wants to, we kind of wrap ourselves around that expression. We internalize the charge, right? We internalize the stress because maybe just for social niceties, maybe even for survival, we realize we can't respond the way our body is asking us to respond. So our bodies wanna run and scream and discharge this energy, but instead we internalize the charge that we feel. Now, even if the stressor, the thing that's causing you stress goes away, the stress response is still alive in your body. If we never clear this charge, we'll continue to carry it and it will keep us stuck. And so just like how you see animals after like maybe the antelope was chased by a cheetah 
And then after it like shakes everything out and like vomits, it goes through this process of literally discharging the charge that it feels. And then it can come back to a state of rest and renewal and harmony. So that's how it comes back to that green state. So we need to figure out how we can come back to that green state after we've internalized stress. Dr. Edith Eager is an amazing author and woman. She's in her 90s and she's a concentration camp survivor and a psychologist. You might want to check out her books. She says, what comes out of us cannot hurt us. It's what we hold in that can. The other thing she says is the opposite of depression is expression. And for mothers, you guys, these quotes resonate so strong because a lot of times we feel isolated or we feel ashamed that we're having these feelings of rage or that our marriage seems to be falling apart or all these things. But the more that we can come together and share our stories and the more that we can consciously move and breathe in ways that help like express ourselves and move the stress out of our bodies, the healthier, the more clear, the happier, the more resilient we will be. So it's time to reset. We need to learn how to discharge the stress we have absorbed, and we have to learn to communicate states of safety to our brain and body. So we can consciously move into that green zone, that ventral vagal dominance at will. And yoga offers many tools to support regulation. It was designed to support us and it has worked for thousands of years. That's why it's still around. So science is coming out and saying, hey, all these like weird yoga breathing techniques, they actually work and here's why. And we'll get into that, which is great. But these are really time tested methodologies to support our well being. Mm. So the action required, what I mean by that is the practices that you're going to choose that you're going to engage with. It's going to depend on what state you're in. So if you're in a fight or flight state, your practice is going to be very different than if you're trying to free yourself from that kind of freeze state. In either case, though, the goal is to move out of a dysregulated state and come back to a state of social engagement, of regeneration, rejuvenation, and ease. So first, let's talk about this fight or flight state. So again, it is priming you for action. And to come out of the state, we need to send signals to the brain that we're actually safe and that it's okay to calm down, come down, rest, digest, heal, repair, create. And so we're gonna take a few a look at a few techniques. So we've got breathing, mantra, movement, and meditation, and how we can move into those practices in a way that counteract this fight or flight response. So first is breathing. So the vagus nerve that we talked about, um, it innervates all of our organs and a lot of the information is automatic, but our breathing is something that we can actually change. So while maybe you're not gonna alter your digestion and your pancreatic secretions and your heart rate, we can modify our breathing really easily. So what we wanna do is breathe in a way that we are drawing the air right to the base of the lungs. And you're going to start to feel expansion through the side ribs, through the back ribs. So you start to consciously change your breathing pattern, which in fight or flight is usually really shallow, um, and start to bring a really expansive breath and really key, long, slow exhale. Really important. So when the exhales are long and slow, we are, again, increasing that vagal tone. We're sending messages to the brain that we're safe. So yoga has many breathing techniques that support us in self-regulating during and after stressful situations. Ujjayi breath or ocean breathing, we create a slight constriction in the back of the throat. So it's the same way if you were like in a fog of mirror. That's what you're doing in your throat but you're breathing in and out, ideally through the nose, or at least the inhale comes through the nose. As soon as we start bringing that constriction in the throat, 
it becomes a bit of resistance to our breathing and it's gonna slow the breath down and calm the nervous system. Brahmari breathing is also known as bumblebee breath. So simple and it works to calm the nervous system but it also increases serotonin levels in your brain. And you can do this with your kids. Call it the bumblebee breath use it to calm down and all it is is an expansive inhale fill up and hum and maybe you do it four times maybe eventually you expand it to four minutes i've even used it preparing for like um like in-person meetings that i'm nervous about i'll be in the waiting room just very quietly breathing in and then just humming very quietly out. Um, it's a very effective breath. Shitali is a cooling breath where you stick the tongue out, it makes like a little tube. You breathe in through the tongue and then you close the mouth, breathe out through the nose. So again, we start adding this resistance right away. We're going to slow the breath and we are going to tell the brain that we're safe. Four, seven, eight breathing is just a counted breath. Um, if you're pregnant, you don't ever do the breath retention. And if the count doesn't work for you, you can modify it. Just always keep the exhale twice as long as the inhale. If you are trying to tell your brain that you're safe, exhale is twice as long as the inhale. So for four, seven, eight, it's breathing in for the count of four, holding the breath in for the count of seven, exhaling for the count of eight. And again, maybe you do it four times, maybe you do it for four minutes. I always use this breath if I'm having trouble falling asleep. It's a really good breath to help you with sleep. Mantra. So mantra practices work quickly and effectively to support us in moving out of fight or flight. So anytime that we add sound, it's gonna be a form of resistance breathing. So straight away, you're gonna have that um, message of safety going to the brain. At the same time, once we start using sound, we're actually vibrating um, vagal nerve receptors in the inner ear. So again, sending message through sound that we're safe, but the sound has to be like low and calming. So if you're like doing an oh, that's going to be calming for the nervous system. Whereas if you were like, that's going to be really activating, right? So you want a low, steady, soothing sound. And if you're like, I'm not going to do any like weird chants, just try like humming or using vowel sounds, uh, something like that. Try it on. When we start to use sound, we start to create shift so quickly. Um, so I know it can be a little bit confronting to start using your voice. Uh, but I share this because it's so effective. Now, if you are interested in yoga mantras that are chanted in Sanskrit, San Sanskrit is a vibrational language that is said to restore the body and mind. So the actual sounds start to entrain the vibration of our own cells to restore us back to harmony. Um, furthermore, the mantras often carry a message that will help refocus the mind. So they typically have positive messages attached to them and it helps us get out of kind of that monkey mind where we're just regurgitating the same story over and over and over so instead of letting our mind run free we give it something to chew on um yeah and mantras can bring us back to truth in the messages that they carry so they bring us to something bigger than the little mundane things that we stress over Movement. So again, we come back to this concept of completing the stress cycle. So I love to, in my classes, bring cathartic movement. So maybe you're inhaling arms up and then exhaling, throwing the hands behind you and making a sound like, huh, like you're actually doing the movements and the sounds that at the time of the stress, you're like, that's not appropriate to do right here. You get into a safe space and you're just like, clearing it out using your sound using your movement just like huh these cathartic movements are so good <clears throat> balancing postures really helpful 
because they take all of our awareness. They take all of our attention, right? If you're in a balancing pose, you're probably going to start to get more into your body and a little bit less in your head and less kind of circling those stories again, because if you are doing that while you're in a balancing posture, you're going to fall over. So it really commands your attention. There's also some movements. So if you're in that fight or flight state, you can start to work into inversions. So anything where kind of the legs are up above the heart um, are going to help you. So, or sorry, when the head is below the heart, it helps to create a calming response on the nervous system and increases heart rate variability, which is a measurement of the resilience of your nervous system. So inversions would be like something like legs up the wall, um, happy baby pose, shoulder stand. If you're trained in it, maybe you're doing headstand, handstand, forearm stand, things like that. Even downward facing dog would be an inversion. Um, forward folds help us to kind of move out of that fight or flight state. It draws us more inward. And child's pose would be a beautiful option. So those are all really helpful. Now with this, if you're in a fight or flight state, typically you're gonna to wanna to move first and then bring it down to those like calming forward folds, child pose, legs up the wall. If you just start with something like child's pose, you're gonna be laying there and your mind is gonna be just like, wow, what's going on? Uh, meditation and yoga nidra. So if you are feeling activated and in this fight or flight state, it is going to be really challenging to be still and to just be observant of what's going on, but it's also probably what you need the most. Typically, I say, like I just said, move your body first and then start to find your seat and then start to find your stillness. So you need to discharge that charge you're carrying, that anxious energy you build up, you need it in your body, then you clear it out then you're going to come down to a seat. Um, yoga Nidra can be really helpful because it's a guided practice of bringing your awareness back into your body piece by piece. Really good one for sleep. If you're having trouble falling asleep, pop on a Yoga Nidra and just practice that. And another practice Dr. Joe Dispenza does a lot is moving from a convergent focus to divergent focus. So a guided meditation where you are starting by really focusing on what's immediate, what's present in you right at that moment, and then starting to expand your awareness farther and farther out. So when we do that, we start to switch off the nervous, um, that fight or flight state, because when we're in that state, all of our awareness comes into this like tunnel vision and what that kind of guided meditation does is it takes that tunnel vision and it opens us up. So then we also need to look at how do we move out of freeze mode? And so the picture that I've got here with this little mouse, this poor little mouse uh, that the cat has caught, this is the example of what freeze mode is. Now, if you have a cat that likes to uh, catch mice like mine does, what you'll find often is they bring them to you and then they put them down to show off what they've caught and then the mouse jumps back to life and starts scurrying around um, because it was just playing dead. It was in freeze mode. It was in the red mode trying to survive. So what we're going to do to balance out our nervous system if we're in this state of freeze is going to be very different than what we do if we're in fight or flight. And so what we need to do is actually get ourselves moving. We need to focus on practices that amplify our life force and have us fully feeling our bodies again. So the goal is to transform feelings of immobilization, numbness, and hopelessness. So breathing, if you're in this like depressed, dark, hopeless state, is going to be very different. You're going to want to work with more fiery breaths. So breath of fire is like a pumping of the belly. And so with the exhales, you draw the belly back really actively. The breath comes out through the nose and then the inhale just happens. So it looks like this. And you start to build this kind of fire in your belly, just pumping, 
the breath. Maybe you start with 20 rounds, maybe you work it up to about a minute. It's also something you could just do in the shower. If you wake up in the morning and you're really groggy, pop in breath of fire in the shower to help you wake up. Adrenal twist, you take the hands up on the shoulders, you inhale, rotate left, exhale, rotate right. And you're just gonna move through that same sort of breath like, So pumping the belly, breathing a little faster. Vastrika pranayama and tumo breathing, which is also known as Wim Hof breathing, is very vigorous breath. Um, you would not do it if you're pregnant. And it's very activating. So you are actively really forcing the breath in and out, in and out. Um, with the tumo breathing or Wim Hof, he's like the ice guy. Uh, he teaches this tumo breathing and actually people call it Wim Hof breathing now because he teaches it uh, where you're actively breathing really hard in and out 30 rounds then you hold the breath out as long as you feel comfortable doing then you release you breathe in and you hold the breath in for 15 counts and typically you would do that in the morning and you do about three rounds now it's very vigorous if you've got something like hypertension, if you're pregnant, um, if you're doing it and it just doesn't feel right, then you would stop. But it's very like, like you can see all the muscles working, like you are pulling that air in and clearing it out and it is going to wake you up. Mantra, again, works really quickly it helps focus our mind so it gets us out of the stories that are really keeping us stuck and a lot of the sanskrit mantras are opening us up to a higher power which can really help with hopelessness to remember that there's a bigger picture to remember that you can pray you can ask for help um you know for whatever you believe in as creator uh using life affirming mantras that invoke messages of strength and resilience and power will really uplift your spirits and the vibration will recalibrate it will entrain your cells so it will literally change the way that your cells are vibrating movements uh, we want to move the body so again in that fight or flight you don't want to sit and meditate but in this freeze mode you don't feel like moving you just want to be still and like whoa, just melt right movement will help you more than anything if you are stuck so even if that wasn't yoga even if you just got out and went for a run that will help you um but what we want is active movement so maybe you get into some dancing sun salutations some vigorous kundalini kriyas we want to get your heart rate up and we want to lift the stagnant energy you're feeling any sort of shaking, cathartic movements, clapping, patting down the body. This will all help bring us back into our body. It will help bring us back to that green zone that we wanna be in. And holding strong postures for longer amounts of time with intention will help build your strength and resilience. So if you are in that warrior two shape, and you are feeling your muscles engage and you're feeling your breath expand to hold you there and you're practicing with intention, that shape starts to remind you of your strength. It reminds you of your resilience and it draws you back into your body. Meditation and yoga nidra. So moving meditations are really good because again, if you're already immobilized, just lying down for meditation might exacerbate how you're feeling. And so even a very mindful vinyasa practice where you're linking breath and movement, that could be your meditation or a walking meditation where you're really focused on the feeling of your feet moving on the floor. Um, so and any meditation that really brings awareness back into your body, because the tendency in this state is to dissociate, to numb out. Um, we want you feeling more deeply. We want you to bring your awareness back into your body and surrounding. So yoga nidra, again, a really great practice to bring you back into your body. But even with that one, I would say move first, get into some vigorous movement before you move into your yoga nidra. 
So just in summary, diving into these various limbs of yoga can help us self-regulate and bring us back into a nervous system tone that promotes wellness, clarity, connection, renewal, and inspiration. So we have tools that can take us out of that red zone, out of that yellow zone, bring us back into that green zone. Um, and it is when we adopt a daily practice that we're really going to see results. We need to show up any day that you have stress, you need some form of self-regulation to move that stress out of your body and to just really reset. So often when people say, I did yoga and it didn't work for me, they maybe did it a couple times. Maybe they did it four times in a month. I would rather you get on your mat for 10 minutes every day, even if you're just doing a mantra practice, a meditation, maybe like a really short, um, movement video get on your mat every day for 10 minutes is better than showing up once for 90 minutes okay what you do every day will help you more than what you do you know once maybe twice a week so what becomes possible when we can live most of our lives in this biochemistry of creation and connection this photo that I have up here was about three years after we decided to separate initially, like when we hit that rock bottom worst point. And at that point, I would never have imagined that we would be thriving. Like it was so dark and so hard. I never thought that we could like really fall in love again or feel passion again or any of those things and this was a trip that we took to mexico and were in love and the kids were so amazing and we just had this great time and choosing to you know take responsibility for my inner world and my experience created new possibilities that i couldn't have even really imagined or visualized at the time so when we shift from a biochemistry of survival to creation, we move from what is predictable and familiar, so the things that you already have, into possibility where something new could happen. So when we move into that ventral vagal dominance or that state of connection and renewal, we begin to expand our vision. We increase our capacity for real connection. We restore our physical and mental health and step into the empowering role as co-creators in our lives. So once you start to learn to shift your inner world, you can actually align your thoughts, words, and actions with your wildest dreams. You get to start showing up on purpose instead of just living from autopilot. Because when you are in chronic stress, you don't have that choice. You have to clear that stress first or physiologically, you have to run on autopilot because your body thinks that your life is at risk. Another quote from Glennon Doyle, what if the call of motherhood is not to be a martyr, but to be a model? Moving into possibility. So can you imagine and maybe right now you can't, but I'm telling you, these possibilities exist. Imagine waking up and feeling energetic and greeting the day with enthusiasm, like real enthusiasm, not the kind that is like fueled by coffee. Imagine holding your center and returning to center, even though the world is spinning into chaos. Imagine getting clear on what matters and unapologetically saying no to the things that are not your top priorities. Imagine trusting yourself and valuing yourself and evolving into your fullest potential. Imagine restoring peace and appreciation into your marriage or partnership. Imagine really being present and playful and patient with your kids. Imagine rejoicing in your life and moving from gratitude from a thought into an actual embodied state. So living from a state of gratitude. And imagine if you could feel peace and ease and inspiration and connection to the divine, to the creative force of the universe, 
even in your most ordinary moments. When we start to live from the state of renewal and possibility, you start to actually see the world differently. So even though you still might be doing something mundane, you feel the life in that moment. It's very life affirming. You feel the joy, you feel possibility in your bones, even if you're just washing the dishes for the 10th time that day. That's what becomes possible. And the sky's the limit. Like possibilities are only limited by your imagination. When you can live most of your life from that ventral vagal state, so we want to be there 80% of our day, you will see and interact with the world in a whole new way. Literally, you are blind to possibilities in your life when you're in chronic stress because your brain takes in so much information. And if you're in stress, your brain is like, I only want the information that tells me what threats exist. I only want the information that's going to tell me how to survive. So there's all this information coming in that doesn't really land because you're not in a state to integrate that information. You're not in a state to see possibility, even if it's there. So just reflect what possibilities do you want to open to and create? So here's what we've covered so far today. So we looked at why modern mothers are burning out. What does it cost us and our families to live in a state of chronic stress? How can yoga, so specifically breath work, movement, mantra, meditation, how can it move us from a survival state into a creative state. And we looked at what becomes possible in this new state of being. So where do we go from here? I know that was a lot of information and I will send you a recording of this so that you can revisit it if you need to and take notes. So you've got a couple of options. Your first option is to take what I've shared with you today and just have a stab at it yourself. See how you go. So I've shared a lot of ideas on breath patterns that could help you, movement patterns that could help you. And there are a lot of free resources online. So if you feel fairly confident, go ahead and try it out. See how you go. Another option for those of you wanting a little bit more support would be to join my Soul Medicine online community. So I have an online library where I lead people through these practices and it's on demand. So it's from wherever you want, whenever you want. And I can help you figure out which practices will help you reach your individual goals and create content to support your needs and revolutionize your life. So I actually will take phone calls and emails to understand where people are at. What are your circumstances? What are your limitations? What are your goals? And what practices would specifically help you at this time? There are four things that you will need to be successful in whatever path you choose. You need to understand how to practice in a way that effectively creates internal change. So yoga is not just yoga. It's not like just go to yoga, you'll feel better. You need to know what state you're in and what you want to shift or how you want to feel when you're done, because that will determine which practices are best for you. You need the ability to either lead yourself or you need access to something that's on demand and something that will work for you that you know is proven. It needs to be something that's flexible because the schedules in motherhood are erratic and unpredictable. And as much as it's nice to, you know, if it's possible, carve out time, like I mostly practice in the morning, but sometimes that doesn't happen. So I need flexibility in being able to practice sometimes at noon. Sometimes it's just a guided meditation at night. And then you need someone or a community that is trustworthy and knowledgeable to turn to when you have questions or concerns or requests. So when things in your life change and you're like, oh my gosh, what I was doing isn't working. Am I on the right path? What do I do? 
you need to have community to connect with. So this Soul Medicine Online Yoga community, you will have unlimited, unlimited access to on-demand guided practices. Um, it offers flexibility to help you develop a true daily practice. And it has to be like, obviously, maybe you're gonna miss a day or two here or there, but you need to build it into your lifestyle. It's not this extra thing. It's not like do this for 30 days, you'll be good forever. Like it's these small practices that you do every day. Um, I also am starting monthly Zoom group mentorship calls. Uh, the first one is next week because there's a gap right now in all these online offerings where there's you're missing community and you need to be able to talk to someone to get your questions answered and to connect with other humans that are going through the same thing. Um, so in addition to these mentorship calls, you also have email support from me and you can send class requests or even emails to inquire about um, what would work best for you. So here's what it says this online platform could do for you, but it's if you actually do it, right? That's the key piece. So it's not enough to just sign up for some membership. You have to be ready to commit to yourself. So it can increase your energy, help you feel alive again. It can bring more presence and patience into your relationships and help you develop clarity in your life. So you're not just feeling in this brain fog all the time. It can help your mental health. So if you're suffering with anxiety, depression, insomnia, there are practices that can support you to regulate your nervous system to bring you out of those states. And it strengthens, opens, and fortifies your body. So here's what's included with the membership. Of course, you have the on-demand access to the Soul Medicine Online Yoga Library. Um, and right now there's about 80 videos and audios that you can access and it grows every week. I add new things. You've got email support from myself. There is community support in my Facebook group and the monthly live group mentorship calls. And here's what a few other people have said. So Deanna is a mother of two and she says the transformation transformations have been remarkable. Many tears shed lots of laughter, limitations banished, so much openness, it's been unforgettable and literally mind altering. All incorporated into my daily life now are meditation, yoga, I can even do a headstand, which is not a prerequisite. Don't stop because you don't think that you'll ever do a headstand, <laughs> you don't have to. Breath work, mantra, awareness, vision, prayer, and lots of PDDP, pre-dinner dance parties. Yes, that can count as yoga sometimes too. I am beyond thankful to you, Liz Nerland, for being such a catalyst to us all in creating our life vision and knowing we all have the ability and power to see it through with the right perspective, awareness, and mindfulness. I am a yogi for life. And then Riley says, I'm so excited for this offering. So this was right when COVID hit and I first launched. It's an answer to my prayers. I'm so thankful to be walking with your guidance during this time. Honestly, it's so authentic. I can easily feel like we're in the room together. My two-year-old and I listened to the Lakshmi mantra this morning and it was with us all day, which was so special, especially singing the baby to sleep, your smallest yogis. Megan, also a mother of two, through Elizabeth's leadership, coaching and yoga, she supports women to connect their true selves to each other and to that which is greater. Elizabeth equips her clients with tools to live their best lives and nurture others through mastering mindset, breathwork, and movement. And then there are a couple of ooh, anonymous love notes. So this one, I thank God for you and your yoga classes on days like today, Liz. For almost two weeks, I have been up four times a night and early for the day with a teething toddler. The exhaustion, frustration, rage, loneliness, disconnection, and lack of emotional support from my husband is real. We are both spent and have nothing left to give. All I want is a break to refill my cup. With tears streaming down my face, I'm grateful for you and your teachings. And although exhausted, I will turn 
on one of your videos at nap time to restore my soul. Thank you, Liz. Another thank you for being such an amazing energy. You have been so much more than a yoga teacher for me. This year has been extremely hard for me and your vibrant spark and joy has been my light at the end of the tunnel. And another, hey Liz, I took your class last night and it was absolutely fantastic. Exactly what I needed and really lifted my spirits. Thank you so much. Now, if you are skeptical of online yoga, you are not alone. And honestly, that was me before COVID. I would never have done online yoga. Um, Tracy also was very skeptical of online yoga, but she said, I had some resistance to the online practice because it's simply not the same as a community class. Now that I've gotten out of my own bloody way, it has been amazing. Thanks again for everything, specifically your choice of words. You are different. So again, this comes back to what I said at the start is we say we want change in our life, but sometimes we're unwilling to change ourselves. And we have to actually ask, why? Is this true? Can I really not do online yoga? Have I actually tried it? And now it's your turn. You can totally do this. Inner transformation is achievable. And when you commit to daily practice, you're not only investing in yourself, but in the well being of your entire family. So it is for you if you want to move from vi uh, victim to vision, if you want to be defined by your character, not circumstance, if you are ready to make a commitment to yourself to reclaim your energy and revolutionize your life. It's for you if you understand that you need to nourish yourself daily in order to serve and connect to the people you love most. And it's for you if you wanna be more present, patient and loving in your most important relationships. So what is all this worth to you? My regular pricing on the platform is $50 a month, but for joining me in this webinar, I would love to offer you a deal. So for the next 48 hours, and this will be sent out in an email to you, you can use the promo code inner mastery to receive special pricing of just $33 a month. And this is not like for your first month, this is for life. So if you sign up, you can lock in that rate forever. So if all this did for you was help you feel more peace, clarity, joy, and inspiration in your life, would it be worth $33 a month? If all this did for you was help you be more present and patient with your children, would it be worth $33 a month? If all this did for you was help you feel less reactive, more compassionate, and connected in your key relationships, would it be worth $33 a month? And I'm offering a seven day free trial. So you can check it out. The first seven days are totally free. You can try it on, see if it will work for you. And you can cancel before day eight if it's not and no charges will incur. And canceling is super easy. You just do it with the click of a button. You don't have to reach out. So this will be coming out to you um, in your email or you can just Copy down the link at the bottom, soulmedicineyoga.mykajabi.com. It will be live for 48 hours and you can lock in that $33 a month membership fee for life. So you'll pop in the address, then in the top left corner, you will go to the store, click on store. You'll go to the Soul Medicine Membership enter the code inner mastery and then it'll ask you to fill in your personal information hit complete my purchase and celebrate this new beginning of possibility so you can get started today i will send you a link or you can copy this down and register now i would love